Okay, today we're going to talk about suspensions, crutches, and pendulums. Uh, and again, there was a technical article that I had written a couple of years ago on this topic, and I'm going to follow it along fairly close so that you'll be able to make reference to it if you want to look anything up. And as we go along today, I'm going to show you a lot of clocks so you can have a real uh, example of what we're talking about. So I, I got to do a lot of shifting of stuff because I've got about 15 clocks lined up here to, and, and different things. So, uh, so we're going to talk about how the energy, because when you think about a clock, its whole goal in life is all those gears in the, in the uh, time train is to keep that pendulum swinging because gravity and uh, other forces are trying to stop that pendulum from swinging. So the pieces we're gonna talk about today are the last pieces in that uh, the suspension. So it allows effect the flexibility, kind of like a hinge affair for the pendulum to swing and the crutch the crutch is the piece that's attached to the uh, escapement arbor and and uh, through uh, different mechanisms, it's attached to the pendulum. So, so as the escapement swings back and forth, it gets its power from the escape wheel. It's going to give a kick to that pendulum rod in some form. So we're going to look at that. And the pendulum itself, the bob, provides the mass and, and it swings in a rhythmic fashion, uh, only disturbed very minimally from the, uh, from the crutch and the escapement. So because the, the more and the harder you try to influence that, the more erratic it becomes. And we're going to talk about, about that in a fair amount of detail. So that's kind of the three things we're going to talk about. Uh, so, okay, so, so this is kind of an important topic, uh, but it, it's also a hard thing in clocks to repair. I probably should have, oh, I'll just leave it the way it is. Uh, because like if, when you take a clock apart, if you see wear in the pivots, you see dirt and all that, like that's pretty, e pretty obvious. So it, it's easy to solve. But a lot of times, like you may have a pendulum that wobbles and, and you, there's nothing obvious. So you have to try to figure out, you know, it, it can be a very minute thing that will cause that to wobble. So it, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, in some ways difficult, but, uh, they're simple looking things but, and you know there's a few key things that you need to keep in mind as you're doing that so the crutch pendulum and suspension was designed in 1657 by christian uh, youngins before that they used a, a clock was governed by a foliate and i actually have an example of a foliate clock i'm going to travel here This is a foliar clock. Now it, it's a modern model and to adjust the time, what they would do is they would move these in and out. Uh, and you can see that if we look in closely, you see the two foliar paddles going back and forth. So that's what they had to use. And then in 1657, somebody said there's a better way and the better way was a, a pendulum and a okay. suspension. So the, the first thing that we're gonna look at is uh, there's different suspension types. Uh, the first one is a knife edge suspension. And if we look here on the top, the cuckoo cock, suspension system is a knife edge suspension. Uh, I can show you one of those. You've, you've all seen one, but I have one running here. 
Now that's a knife edge suspension. Because this point here is actually represents kind of a knife edge and it swings back and forth on that single on that single point. It, uh, and that's a problem when that single point wears in the in the knife edge suspension. Now I can actually show you a, I'll show you a clock, a true knife edge suspension the clock. Pendulum. You can see down here that they have a lock because the, on a true knife edge, the pendulum is locked. It's a very small weighted pendulum and it's fastened to the uh, the escapement arbor. Now let me bring it up a little bit. So I'll just lift the knife edge up. You see the knife edge there at the top? And that's a true knife edge suspension. This clock is somewhere early mid 1700s, but that's what they had. They weren't great timekeepers because the, uh, the pendulum bob was very light and you can see the knife edge that would wear. So that's a, that's a true knife edge clock, original knife edge clock. So the next thing we're gonna talk, the next type uh, is uh, the suspension clock because as they grew, they found that that wasn't good timekeeping using knife edges and, and so that type. So then they actually got into, when they got into the, the uh, suspension spring, so there's different forms of that. Uh, so this is the English style and you'll see that on the back of a lot of, uh, so there's a, I'll just do a, this is a, an old grandfather clock and you can see it has the English style, the, they call that a back cock, where the suspension spring hangs in. Uh, okay, so in this case, it would be this type of a suspension spring that would fit in that and you can see it would fit down. So that's the English style. Uh, that would solve that. So you, you can see this piece fits in the crutch. This crutch here is all bent up. This was a, an old clock that somebody gave me. So that's the English really style really of suspension. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Looks familiar, right? They, they usually made very, very rugged and you don't have too much trouble with them. The only trouble you might have is you can't really bend that crutch together. You might have to glue a, a thin shim of a couple thou piece of brass onto the side of it to take up any play. Uh, now the, the American clocks, uh, all the American clocks, I'm just gonna do it by hand instead of trying to fight. No, all the American clocks. They used. You can see here it's a solid brass stud and there'd be a slit in it that the. Uh, that the suspension spring hangs from. You see that on all American clocks. Uh, that's how they hung their suspension. The next one is the, the Brocott, which is the, this one down here in the bottom. And it always came with the, uh, the open escapement clocks. They all had a Brocott so that they could adjust it. This is the adjustment mechanism that you can uh, turn from the front. There would be a, a hole up at the top and you can see the shaft. This is just an old movement. It's all damaged, but it makes a good. And they used a very fine 
uh, Brocut. This is the Brocut suspension. Uh, it has that cutout because that cutout, as you can see, fit into the notch so that the turning wheel wouldn't catch it. Now, this one has a real problem that we're going to talk about later. Uh, it's a good example for to talk about, but that's the Brocott suspension. Very, very thin, flexible metal spring. The next one that we're going to talk about is the silk thread suspension. Okay, you can see. You see the silk. Uh, you can see the silk thread here. And for adjustment, they have this knob and the thread is wrapped around it. So for lengthening and shortening it, you just turn that knob and it shortens and lightens the spring. Now the, the silk thread, they have a very unusual uh, pendulum. I'll just pop this one off. Because it's only, a, originally they were silk thread. Now I lost it. So you can see, um, you can see a very light, a very light bob on it. And it has a square piece that fits through the crutch and it has a hook. So if you see that style, you know that was from a silk thread. You can see that one is running away quite nice there without. This was a clock I bought. I thought it was all original, but come to find out it was in a marriage. And somebody uh somebody tried to sell something that wasn't right. They did. As, as soon as I as soon as I got it, why uh, I bought it on eBay, and as soon as I got it, why I started a discussion with the person selling it. Anyway, we come to an arrangement, and I still have it. It help it, when you're buying clocks. It helps to know about these things because you can tell when the, somebody has done a marriage. So that's a silk thread type suspension. So that kind of covers the most common types that you're going to come across. Well, here, there it is, the diagram showing of a silk thread. Sometimes you'll get back cocks on the old grandfather clocks that they have two notches. So you could actually hang the suspension from either one depending on, because all these grandfather clock movements were made separate from the case. And then somebody would build a case and they would put it in. So depending on how much room they need, they would. Uh, and this type of suspension over time, they seem to want to bend and sag down. So you have to deal with that. So those are the different styles of suspension you'll come across. So now let's talk about suspension springs. If we look at a suspension spring, okay, so here's a suspension spring. Well, actually, I, I had one out before. Uh, so you have your top block. This is your this is your top block. Uh, now, in this case, it fits into a notch, and it would set like that. So that would hold it from going down. Sometimes there's a hole in the top block, but that has to be securely fastened onto this spring. It can't be loose. And then you have the actual spring part. And then you have your bottom block. Now in this case, it's threaded. 
and uh, it fits onto for an, an old grandfather clock. They used a steel rod. So this is just a, a threaded rod that screws into that so that you can attach, attach the rod. There's problems with that rod that we're gonna talk about later, but so those are the three pieces in a suspension spring. This now, is a modern day our... Hermely, uh, a number six suspension spring. They all have the same, except this case, there's a pin that goes through the back cock that holds it. And you have two fine springs and then you have your bottom block. And this bottom block has two, has a pin. So what you would do is the top of your suspension would, would have two hooks that would go down and catch that. So that's the, that's the modern style when you're dealing with Hermes and, and things like that that you'll come across. The key to all those components is that they, they can't be loose. All those components have to be tightly fitted. If there's any play, that's a source of problem. And that spring can't have any creases in it. It has to be flat. Now in the old grandfather clocks, it's fairly heavy. That is, I'll just quickly measure it here. It, that's seven tau thick, you know, so it's fairly heavy. Uh, the consideration is in all these is depending on the weight. Now, the weight that's on that is a lead, lead weight with a brass face on it. So, it, you know, it's a fair amount of weight. So that suspension spring has to be able to carry the weight. If you think back at the silk thread one that we talked about, had a very light pendulum bob because it was a silk thread suspension spring. Today, they use a cotton thread. It can't be a stiff thread. It has to be a flexible thread because uh, I don't know where you get silk thread from. Uh, something to consider, I'll get my, I'm using the, these same pitches are in the technical article. It's just that I, uh, they don't come out as clear as I'd like to see them in the, uh... so you, you can see a couple issues here with the, uh... maybe I'll go in closer. You can see that suspension spring, if there's any play in the top, it won't function properly. And if the block, if the spacing in the block with the two pillars that the pin goes through, if that's wobbly, it won't work properly. All those fittings have to be, they have to be loose enough that they can move easily, now but tight a... enough that there's no play in them. One of the things you'll get into, especially in older clocks, if you're replacing the suspension spring with a modern day one, the old metal they used for suspension spring wasn't near the quality of springiness that the modern day stuff has. So if you replace one with the same thickness, it may be stiffer and the, the clock may run faster. And the same thing with any spring, if you re just replace the spring and then all of a sudden the clock runs fast, that means that spring has much more springiness or tension. So it, it has more torque in it. So it's gonna spring back and forth and make the clock run faster. Usually you can get away with that if there's enough adjustment in your pendulum to slow it down. So just keep that in mind if you replace a suspension spring and all of a sudden the clock is running faster, the spring material is much thicker. Now there's a little chart that I have in the article uh, in, in this book on escapements. It talks about long case that's uh, six millimeters by point. Well, let's do it in thou. So a quarter inch by seven thou for a long case clock. Uh, see that one that I just measured was, what did I measure that at? It was, it was much heavier than what they, yeah, it's about seven thou. 
So it's it's what the chart says. So for long case clocks, those are grandfather type clocks. Bracket clocks is four thou. English style clocks is four thou. German wall clocks is two thou. And U.S. shelf and wall clocks is one point two thou. So it, it's very critical to have the right. This is my assortment uh, of different suspension springs. Uh, let's just take and measure that one that I just had out there a while ago. This is a modern one used in a Hermley type clock. Yeah, that's two thou. So, and to get rid of what they did is they also got rid of some of the metal. They just have two strips. Now, the problem with these is they're easily kinked. And if you try to rub one side to take the kink out, the clock will, the bob will run crooked. You have to do the same thing to both sides because you're actually lengthening the metal. It, uh, now, some of these more modern ones actually come, those have metal blocks, but some of them have plastic blocks and that will break real easy. Uh, I don't see anything there. Yeah, so, so you'll end up needing quite an assortment of different suspensions, uh, especially for me where you can see all these, these here are for grandfather clocks. You can see where I've cut pieces and because you have to make them fit. Uh, so if you're working on older clocks, you'll you'll need a, a different assortment of so, them. Again, the stiffer the spring works better with a heavier bob. Uh, the old grandfather clocks had much heavy bobs on them than the modern clocks. So, okay, so if we look at different countries, again, like I showed you this long case one. There's the top block, the spring, and then the bottom block. Now this one. These are from bracket clocks. That's usually wood with a piece of uh, suspension spring. And I have a, a sample there to show you of a bracket clock. This is a, an old English beehive bracket clock. And in this particular case, you'll see, uh, you'll see the brass, and then you see the suspension spring is here on the, I don't know if I can get in a little closer to, at a side angle for you to. So you can see the, the metal, the top block. And if, we, if I take my fingers, there's a touch of play in that. Now these clocks are ones that I bought. I haven't gone over them, so I don't know what problems will be in them. So, so that's the style that they made uh, for the old bracket clocks. Now, you know, these could be later 1800s into the 1900s that this design was. This is actually quite a, a nice clock. It has uh, six gongs. I think it, yeah, it's a W and H, a winter halter and Hofmeyer, a nice example of a, Just check and see if it's a fusey. No, it's not a fusey. That usually adds more value. And this is the face on it. it uh, it's got brass inlay, so it, it, it's a nice clock. You'll find each one of these countries, they kind of follow tradition and you, you know, and use the same style. So that was the bracket. So the, the German uh, and bracket wall clocks, uh, they were similar. So they just had a, a piece of steel. Sometimes it was pinned and sometimes it, the, the top block just set in a notch and then a piece of spring in the bottom. They were, uh, now we get into the, uh, the American suspensions. Now I have a, a bunch of them. 
this is the very oldest, the very old one. What they did is they just took the steel and rolled it out flat. There's no, uh, there's no connection. You can see they rolled out the steel and then there was either a little wire or a punch mark at the top to keep it from sliding through that the brass post with a slit in it. You can see the, the little lump. And then sometimes they would take the suspension spring, file away half. Pagano used this a lot in Canada. They would file away half the metal and then they would put it through a hole and then fold it over. So you always want to check them. That's fairly tight. Sometimes you got to reseat those. And then there's another style where they where they uh, fastened it. Sometimes they were riveted on. There's another one where the uh, This is somebody trying to tighten it up. They uh, put a bunch of solder on it. The problem is, you can see the problem there when you look at it, it's not straight. That pendulum has to hang straight. So that's gonna go cockeyed and, and cause you wobbling or, or different things. So if you look at all these, see they're all straight. Any of the newer ones, that one's a bit cockeyed. Some of this American stuff was made fairly, you're not allowed to say cheap, you have to say inexpensive. So that, that's a lot of what the American, all, all the, what the American used. The German liked to use those, uh, because like that Hermely one I showed you was a German one and you can see with the top lock and then they have two split thin suspension springs and then the bottom block. And then the French Brocot one I showed you was the same thing, except with the Brocot escapement, they like to have front time adju uh, adjustment. So it has that notch in it. Those are very, very delicate, especially the old original ones. They kink and that's why you never leave the pendulum on the clock when you're moving it. Cause it'll twist and kink and uh, once you have a kink in that suspension, you have problems. So let's talk about crutches. This, here's a, a new, this is a new uh, grandfather clock crutch. You, this is the piece that would fit onto the escapement uh, arbor. And then it comes down and then you bend it at right angles. And then the, uh, if I can find my piece that I, so then this fits in that. Now that's a pretty good fit. There's no wobble, it slides. Well, it doesn't quite slide. Uh, well, if it's hanging straight, it slides, no problem. And you'll also notice the top corners are rounded off. Now this needs to be polished. It's got a little bit of residue and rough edges. So you always want to polish them so that, uh, because as a pendulum swings, it's actually raising up and down when it goes from one side to the other. We're going to talk about that in, in length here in a minute, but it, uh, it's important to have that uh, and then put a light amount of oil on that crutch because you don't want any burrs or anything. Okay, so, so here we're talking about the crutch loop. You can see where I said that they need to be rounded because that has to be, it has to be, it has to be a good fit, but a nice slip fit, not a tight fit because you never want it to jam. But now, as that pendulum swings, uh, if you look at the line here, you can see it's in the middle. And when it swings to the left, the line comes up a little bit and the further it goes, 
that line represents because that's swinging an arc and the pendulum gets shorter or, or the uh, actually the uh, the crutch the crutch is on a different pivot point than the pendulum so therefore they make two different swings I guess it's the best way so that's why you that's why the corners around it and that's nice smooth fit because if it's a tight fit anywhere it can jam and, and there'll be a loss of power so so that needs to be uh be looked at in all clocks so we're going to look at uh various ways that suspensions are fastened so here it just uh, there's a block in the top so it can't slide through here there's a pin sitting on the top and here there's a pin through the middle uh, they're, they're all common ways and in the american ones uh there's a block on the top american always has a round post that's fastened to the back plate and you always want to check that to make sure that that rivet hasn't come loose over time because sometimes you have to tighten them up a little bit. Uh, so there's various ways that they, <clears throat> so if we look, now if we look at the crutch, there's the different styles of crutches. This one has a hole, uh, just a hole. This one has a slot that it can fit into. This is the traditional American crutch. Uh, this would be one that somebody, somebody bent so it, it just uh the they take the wire and bend it around and sometimes that brass is fairly hard and it breaks and you have to rebend it to make a new one sometimes uh now if you look if you look at a, a modern day This is a modern day Hermley. And again, it has the plastic blocks and it has what they call a leader. Here's your crutch. And then the leader goes down and then the pendulum hangs on the leader. They all, uh, they all do the same function, just in slightly different ways. Now, this is a nice one. I actually have one of these in a good stuff Becker, the high end clock. So to put it in beat, what you do is you're moving that pin back and forth. Uh, it, it's a really nice way to put in, put a clock in beat instead of bending the, uh, the crutch rod. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is the biggest problem you'll find in clocks. Guaranteed the biggest problem. Uh, I'll show you a clock that has that. So this is the clock and it has a loop. And sometimes that crutch loop gets bent out. And if that uh, suspension is rubbing against that loop on either front or back, the clock won't run. Because there's too much, what you're doing is loading that escapement arbor. And that's, so let's look at a real clock that has that. You see how much play is between that, the uh, suspension bottom block and that crutch. So this has two problems that I see right away. One, it's leaning against the back. It's It should be out in the middle. So to solve that, what you could do would just bend this You got to get me bending tool. So what I'm going to do is just give that a little bend. There. So I solved that one problem. So you can see now where. But you see. You can see the kick from the escape wheel. So there's a. You see how much play is in that? So you're actually losing a lot of your power. So you have to tighten that up. 
The problem you get into when you tighten those up is if, if you take your oh. pliers and you just squeeze that, it's going to get tight. So let's just do that. You see what happened? Now it's the front is narrower. So so that's not good. That has to be free to slide back and forth the whole way. So what I usually do is if you want to do that, I'll measure the rod. That's 70 thou. So I'll probably get a piece of pivot steel about 75 thou and put in there and squeeze it up so I know it can't go tighter than 75 thou. And then then, uh, then uh, I can have the whole thing because I think if we look, the back is probably pretty good. Yeah, see, we, we've got it fairly, it's, it's good in the back, but up in the front where I bent it, it's tight. And it's dirty and uh, corroded a little bit. That has to all be cleaned and polished because you want that to slide nice. So those are the two common things you're going to deal with in the crutches. The other thing is there's a long slot there. And you got to make sure that, yeah, I just pushed it back because those will move. Uh, I pushed it back tight and now I'll give it a pull down to make sure it's tight. So, so now what I did is I adjusted a problem that wasn't there because the suspension spring had actually moved out to the front. So I bent it. Now it's rubbing on the back. So now I got to bend it back where it was because it was right before it just there was another problem that I didn't I didn't carefully look for so the first thing to do is make sure your suspension spring is all the way back there it, it's it's not rubbing in the back tight there's there's a lot of play you notice there's a lot of play the saddle on the escapement is worn out so there's a lot of play But at least it's not loading the. Uh... So those are the three things to be careful of in uh, suspensions and crutches. Okay, we're going to talk about pendulums now. Okay, so this is the, the pendulum and it's a, a bracket, an old English bracket clock style. So you got your point of suspension. And when you're measuring pendulum length, you measure from that center where it's hung. If it's hung on the top, you'd measure from the top. This one you measure from the middle because that's where the pin is. And you measure all that down to the center of the mass. Now the thing to keep in mind is this rod, if it's made out of brass or steel, it's gonna be very heavy. So it's gonna provide some of the mass. So you know where they say the approximate center of gravity, this is the center of the diameter of the bob, but it, the center of mass is above that because all this stuff is included into making that mass. So when you're calculating pendulum length, it's always the center of the mass of everything, not just the bob. So, the, the pendulum induced a much more reliable method of measuring time because it had a natural restoring uh, force. It didn't, because uh, when you swing, if you force the pendulum to swing, gravity is gonna make it wanna come back. So it had that natural restoring force. And it was much more stable. It wasn't affected by lubrication or heat or in, in the sense of making it work. So it was much more, uh, stable and uh, 
than the simple balance wheel that I showed you in that early clock, the, the wooden one with the foliage set up. So if you wanna make a clock run faster, you raise the center of that mass. And that's usually a clockwise turn on the regulating nut. Because every pendulum has a regulating nut on the bottom that you can raise and lower. Now this is just an old demonstration one. This one isn't good because, well, it, it moves easy when I'm adjusting it. One of the things that you that you might get into, and I always check if you if you're screwing the bob up, you're, you're forcing it up. It's not a problem. But if you turn it down and you see the bob is stuck and it doesn't come down, you didn't do any adjustment. You got always make sure. I always give it a little pull if I'm lengthening it to make sure that the bob comes down, so that you're getting a true adjustment. And the the other thing is you want to make sure, because this is the way we're swinging. If we were trying to swing it back and forth like that, it's side two, so you're going to get a lot of air resistance and there'll be other factors coming to play. And that's the reason a bob has a profile so that it cuts through the air and, and it's not impacted as much when it's swinging because you, you wanted it the least amount of resistance when that bob is swinging back and forth. So one of the things, because uh, at, at first they made the pendulums very light and, and they didn't oscillate very good because the lighter the pendulum and the bob is, the easier it is to irritate it. So if you've got a, an escape wheel that's kicking it really hard, you're irritating that and you're not getting a good swing. Matter of fact, if you look at a, a good timekeeper, like a Seth Thomas number two, they don't even hang the pendulum on the movement. There's a cast iron frame that the movement is bolted to and the pendulum actually hangs on this cast iron frame because there's a distortion when you've got that heavyweight moving back and forth that can twist the plates. So they want the least amount of disturbance to that pendulum. They just want that nice little gentle kick in phase from the skate wheel so that it just gently nudges that uh, pendulum enough to keep it running. No more, no less, because you might, uh, I used to think uh, when I first started, well, the clock didn't work right. Why not just add more weight to it? But adding more weight to a clock actually gives you more problems because you're affecting that pendulum erratically by putting more weight and that escape wheel and the crutches are hitting it too hard and kind of rattling the whole thing. You just want to gently nudge it. And, that, and if you look at the expensive good timekeepers, that's all very fine. And, and uh, actually very expensive clocks like good timekeepers run on a much smaller weight than uh, our cheaper clocks do they can get them down to a couple pounds uh, on the more expensive clocks to keep them running so uh so the rigidity of that whole pendulum the suspension and all the joints is uh is critical we're going to do a little bit of math. It wouldn't be right if we didn't do a bit of math. When a pendulum swings, so this is point P, that pendulum swings in a circular motion. If you, but they tried to get it a, a cycloidal so that it wouldn't affect. That's some technical stuff. You may want to, I've got some stuff written. Uh, so the pendulum is one of the most important parts of a clock. It's re regularity and timekeeping is solely governed by its performance, except for receiving a sufficient impulse to maintain its vibration. The pendulum should be perfectly free in its movement and uninfluenced by the gear train. <clears throat> 
So the pendulum is a swinging governor which determines how flax will run. Uh, okay, so the balance between these losses and the energy supply determines the length of the swinging arc. So how hard you're kicking it determines how fast that arc, or how far that arc swings. Uh, so we've got a, a pendulum hanging at P. So the bob swings in a circular path from A to D. So it takes longer to do that than it does from the arc from B to C. And they actually tried to make, tried to put uh, pieces on the clock so that the pendulum suspension would curve around to try to get it to raise up to make that. Uh, so th these differences produced are called circular arc errors. Uh, in practice, changes in swing have a proportional greater effect on timekeeping when the average swing is larger than when it is small. And so you can see it would have more impact the further it has to swing. Uh, so that's why if you look at, again, expensive timekeepers, they have very minimal pendulum swing. So, and George Graham figured this out in 1730 when he developed his deadbeat escapement, because he figured out, because if you look at three degrees between B and C, there's very little difference in them. So he used that when he designed the deadbeat escapement. So he actually designed it so there was only a six degree swing in total. So we're gonna look at the math, how the, so again, this it's basically the same diagram. So if you remember your trig functions, if we come down here at right angles, this becomes a right angle triangle. So, if, so in our formula, we're dealing with three degrees and we're gonna multiply it by two. So it's a method to calculate what six degrees at in a, to a physical distance at the bottom down at the pendulum, what your swing is. So you can actually work it backwards uh, in this formula too. So basically from A to C, is equal to, in this particular case, the, uh, the pendulum length is 12 inches. It was an easy number. You, you'd have to put your own whatever your measurement is. And that's multiplied by the tangent of three degrees times two. So it's 12 times the tangent of three is 0 0.05241. So it comes out to 1.26 inches. So the distance from here to here for six degrees swing at a 12 inch pendulum length. So the bottom of that pendulum is only gonna move 1.26 inches. And you might think that's not very much pendulum swing, but it's actually the correct amount to give a six degree swing for how Graham designed that escapement. So we can actually work it backwards. Uh, if you know the distance that you're swinging and the pendulum length, so I'll put that diagram back up. So let's say we actually measured the distance here uh, and we come up with 1.26 inches. We actually measured it and we know our pendulum length is 12 inches. So if we actually take, so the, uh, the arctan of 1.26 divided by 12. So it comes out to 5.99 degrees. So you can actually work it backwards if, if you wanna measure, but that's only correct for a true deadbeat escapement. Don't try to do it on an anchor escapement. You, you could measure it, but you're gonna get much bigger than six degrees because that's just the way anchor escapements are. We're gonna talk about pendulum faults. Um, So technically a heavy pendulum bob is good as long as the suspension can carry it. The interesting thing about the heavy pendulum bob, uh, uh, so a pendulum is kept swinging by the clock movement, uh, specifically the escapement, 
replacing the energy losses due to bending, the suspension spring, friction in the crutch loop, and gravity and air resistance. So the arc of the pendulum varies as the amount of energy passed to it by the crutch varies. Uh, but a, a bob of a large mass, hence a large potential and kinetic energy, because as it's swinging, it has energy, it suffers a smaller percentage change in the arc for a given increase in energy. So when you're kicking a heavy pendulum bob, it's less affected than if it was a light pendulum bob but by a given amount of energy. That, that's why uh, clocks with a heavy pendulum bob work better. Now you get into some uh, small mass produced clocks, they have very light pendulums and they have a lot of problems uh, so. with suspension. The, the other thing that we wanna talk about very quickly is temperature compensating, like why they make pendulums out of what they make them. So we'll quickly talk about, so uh, just be careful to make sure that there's no rattle, there's no loose joints and that whole path through from your escapement because uh, even sometimes the uh, the crutch rod where it fastens onto the escapement arbor gets loose. So all that has to be perfectly tight to get a good working clock. So let's talk about pendulum bob construction because they, they did a very creative thing. Uh, so they usually round and aerodynamic. This one I said was made out of lead covered in brass. And they only cover it in brass because lead's not very pretty. You can't polish it. Uh, now the early, the early clocks, like I said, was made out of a steel rod. Now, what do we know about steel? Steel expands and contracts with temperature. So, and so if this steel rod expanded, your clock is gonna run slow. And I've noticed on some of my clocks every spring and fall, there's actually a, a change in their temperature keeping because of this very fact. So, so, so they'd come up with what's called temperature compensating pendulums. This steel rod is not a temperature compensating pendulum uh, because steel expands too much. And if you want a, a real example of that, just look how much railroad tracks expand they have to put expansion joints in them. If they didn't in the summer in the heat, they would buckle and bend. So what they did, they actually replaced the, uh, if you look at the expensive clocks, they actually replaced the uh, pendulum with wood. Wood doesn't expand nearly as much as uh, steel. Matter of fact, if you take a board, the, the long grain in the way a board is cut expands much less than the side grain, the, the end, the, the width of the board. So, so this might expand a lot more than what the long grain does. So somebody realized at some point in time that lead expanded much greater than steel or wood. So, so they had a creative idea we can temperature compensate. So let's say, so we know this bob is fastened on the bottom. So if this bob, if this bob expanded, it's fastened its length here. So the length is gonna go longer this way. And we know the, the pendulum rod is coming longer this way, but because lead expands at a much greater rate than the steel or the wood, and even though it's longer, they kind of help cancel each other out. And that was a form of temperature compensation they used in, uh, in old clocks with long pendulums. Now, if you look at some of the old crystal regulators, they actually had mercury in those glass vials and that wasn't put there for looks. It accomplished the same thing because you had the steel pendulum rod and you had the mercury that expanded 
to, to give a form of temperature compensation. And the ultimate temperature compensation is uh, called gridiron pendulum rods. You can look that up. They have multiple different types of metal rods all fastened together that expand and theoretically cancel there each other another, out. So there was another you know, type years ago things. of clock. And you can see here, the little pendulum is actually attached. It's attached straight to the escapement. Uh, stuff like that, I consider novelty movements. You'll see a lot of novelty movements that they do that. They were never made to keep very good time or, and they have a much shorter shelf life because they, they just don't run properly. It's kind of a, a simplified version of the knife edge, except they're using a round pivot hole on any of that stuff? instead of a knife edge. Yes. <laughs> yes, I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. When you have a brass crutch, crutches, the brass is very hard. Do you have a, a trick for to bend this kind of crutch? Yeah, see, they, they shouldn't be made hard. They originally weren't hard. Uh, and, and that's a problem because they want to tend to break. Uh, you can apply some heat to it, but brass is kind of a funny material. It, it doesn't work like steel with heat. Uh, but when you apply heat to it, it kind of relaxes it. Like if you pound brass, if you apply heat, it kind of relaxes it. So it might bend. How much do you have to bend it? Oh, I have to, uh, how much? Uh, uh, not a lot, but uh, when I, when I have tried on a, on a crutch, a brass crutches, very often I have break the, the crutches. I have tried yeah. to eat, but it's difficult. Uh, and I have observed also the the end of the, of the brass crutches are thinner than the the top. Yeah, they they tape it off like a rat's tail, and uh, so I guess so it was easier to bend when they made that little loop down at the bottom. You you just have to be careful. You you can try with the, like your mini torch heating it up to take some of the stress out of it. Uh, that's all I can offer somebody. Ben, uh, you got any suggestions for bending brass? No, I, I think what you're saying, heat, a little bit heated and, and use the proper pliers, which they bend. You know, they, you can have the three prongs and they they will, you, you, you're applying and, and it, it will bend. And, you know, there are type of the, uh, and it should be no problem, you know, of bending. I, I, I know that you can, what my, Michelle is saying is possible. I did break some of those to myself, but that was not, not lately. Maybe because I haven't done any work, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question for you, sir. Well, as soon as you, you answer to Mr. Uh, Michelle, I have a question. Is there any relation between the uh, weight to drive the clock or in the size of the pendulum? I'm sure there's a relationship there somewhere, but you can look at some clocks and the, the better a clock is made, the more highly polished the gears are, the pivots and all that, they run, uh, like I read some articles about building clocks, they usually add I think they, they put weight on enough until the clock will run. And then I think they add a percentage on, on top of that because it's usually only dirt aware that stops the clock. Like if it runs originally, when a clock stops, it means it's dirty and it needs to be serviced. But the American philosophy was let's put a v8 engine in these clocks because people aren't going to service them 
<laughs> so they literally destroy themselves because the spring is so powerful. And uh, but but a heavy pendulum is is disrupted a lot less than a light pendulum. And once it gets swinging, it takes very little bit of force. Yeah. Well, no, no if, question if about you... it, it, it. It even on the tower clocks, they using a heavy pendulum and a longer pendulum because to uh, to to eliminate the shake of the building and everything else, you know, the so inertia of you know the trucks are passing by and so on. So you you're right to stay much more stable. Any astronomical clocks or Julius regulators, they would have a heavier pendulum. And you're right. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, they, uh, I was going to say something and I forgot what it was. It couldn't have been important. But no, it, uh, it, it's, it's an, this whole thing is an interesting topic. And like this is the information I'm giving to you today is enough for you to get by with. Well, for sure. You know, sure. You, you can get into it very deep if you so choose. Uh, hopefully, this will give you enough of a teaser, you know, to buy some books and to study that whole relationship, how all that works. Uh, now, next week, we're going to actually put all these pieces together and get into uh, much deeper stuff when we actually talk about all the different, I think there's about six different types of escapements, how they actually work and the theory and some of the math behind them that actually makes that escape wheel want to keep that pendulum going see because what are you doing when you're making a pendulum swing all you yeah, yes you said you you have three three reference book okay thank what you. they are i'll just quickly go over them uh, uh, the bible on gear cutting and a lot of other theory uh on stuff is by j malcolm wild it's called wheel and pinion cutting in horology there's that one. Uh, if Paul can't find that stuff, I can find it again. And then the, my other Bible that I use is uh, by Laurie Penman. It's uh, the Clock Repairer's Handbook. There was multiple versions of this put out. And then my third, and in some ways for me now, like starting out the Laurie Penman book was more important because I was just learning. And then another book I used was uh, Repairing and Restoring Clock Pendulums, Pendulum Clocks by John Plews. It, it has some stuff in it, but as I got in deeper, then I got into this horology of gear cutting and, and a lot of other theory. And then the final one is uh, Practical Clock Escapements. It's got every type of escapement in there and all the theory. That's where I taught myself how to design and draw an anchor escapement from scratch for a grandfather clock, one that was all twisted and bent and not working properly. And so as you learn more, you need more complicated books. Yes, for sure. Yes. No problem. Thank you. So Any other Paul questions? Paul can't find that because he asked me one time before. I got my workout today, Paul, moving clocks around. The, I had yes, to run around the house trying to find clocks, you know, to show, because hopefully when you see it in reality, it's much more meaningful than a diagram. Yeah. I, I was surprised about your when a knife edge uh, um, suspension <clears throat> because, uh, I mean, Regula is still using that today, and uh, uh, once you get those guys uh, set up, they keep good time. Uh, you know, they're they're not an in, inaccurate uh, uh, timekeeper. It, it's just hard to regulate the pendulum because you're sliding it along a wooden rod. You, you know, you can't. It's hard to do fine adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. Just that little bracket in the back holding it, yeah. And the uh, English clocks, uh, 
uh, when you make up that pen, pendulum with the long suspension, um, long suspension spring, I just had one that I was repairing and that the, the rest of the suspension right down to the bob was a thin piece of uh, metal, not as light as the suspension spring, but still a thin, a fairly thin piece of metal. And I am looking at that. And as it came back and forth, the whole shaft of it was doing, you know, it, it was a good wobbler if you're fishing, but uh, not good on a clock. So I took a piece of uh, rod and I just taped it to the to that uh, suspension uh, length and it took the whole thing out of it and it's been working fine. But I don't know those, why somebody those... would cho choose material like that for, uh, you know, very strange. That was common in, in old grandfather clocks. They use a flat. I actually have one that has flat steel and uh, I have one that has the round rod. So th they were common, but that, that was back in the 17, late 1700s, very early 1800s that they used. Why, why, well, wouldn't they have problems keeping them running? No, the old grandfather clocks run. Those old anchor escapements were very forgiving. And that's why they had 12 pound weights on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that flat steel would not be good in the, it, it would catch the air. It, it, I, I, I'm sure of it, any kind of a, little bit of a, a bend in the metal as it swung back and forth would, would cause a problem. And uh, I'm yeah, surprised. See, it, it... They were inside of a case so that there was no outside influences like wind or people walking by. It was inside of an enclosed case. So it would have very little bit of impact from wind or, or things like that. So, you know, and with that larger weight, you know, they, uh, but you can get those old clocks, you know, within less than a minute a month, pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. Providing the escapement hasn't been altered. <laughs> Hopefully after yeah. we get through this series of six lectures, when you read it, it will be clearer and make more sense. Yeah. Uh, you know. That's my goal anyway. Like, there's no way I can teach you everything. Uh, all I can do is guide you, give you little hints, and, and kind of guide you and create enough interest in your mind to want to go and and uh, learn more. Well, don't stop, Wendell. You're doing a fine job. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll give you a break till next week then, Wendell. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, excellent job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank, see ya. Thank All you. the best. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very best. much. Thank you.